All right, class, first off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So today's lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, some uh, interesting things, especially the Crusades. That's one of the biggest ones at the end. And also, we're going to be talking about um, the basically the lovers and the fighters of the medieval times. Okay, so here's your objectives. We're going to analyze how the Christian church grew more powerful even though the Roman Empire fell. Uh, we're going to examine the equipment used by knights of the Middle and Dark Ages. And we're creating an argument whether Saladin would have fought to the last man. Okay. So. Now, here's your warm-up. Now, as you can tell from this picture, um, there's um, the main focus is in the middle, right? But my thing is this. What's going on here? What are some possible explanations of what's happening here? So I know in your picture it's it's uh, pretty dark because they do use dark, dark colors in this painting. But the thing is, there's several possibilities of what might be happening. What I want you to do is write down the one you think is more than likely a possible explanation of what's happening in this painting. Okay? So look at it, analyze it, look at the people, both, you know, the girls and then the guys, and let me know. Okay, so pause the video, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. All right, so even though Rome fell, the church continued, okay, and the church would continue in different little towns. Now, a cluster of towns was known as a parish, okay? And a group of parish, they needed a leader. So that person who they looked up to was the bishop. Now, in Rome, where the Catholic Church headquarters is, of all the bishops and all the cardinals, the top person was the pope, okay? So the pope is really the top priest, the top bishop, top cardinal, all that stuff okay now monks these guys were basically um like priests uh but the thing is they dedicated their whole life to god and mainly in service of people now in the sixth century the monks got a great role model and that would be saint benedict saint benedict basically um gave his life to service of all people. I mean, this guy would literally give you his shirt on his back if you needed it. Okay. So when uh, St. Benedict passed, the monks took on that Benedict rule and they would be social workers. They would be teachers to help educate the young kids. They would work in hospitals as doctors, nurses, or whatever was needed to treat the sick and injured. And on top of that, they would be the, the hospitality people for travelers. You know, so as you see in this uh, painting here, uh, people are traveling through mountains areas, and they might know, hey, this area, this person, people might get trapped up there. They, they, you know, most people get lost in this area. So they would go there with medicine and bandages, food, water, things like that, and help anyone who needed it. So to the people in the medieval times, these monks were the heroes of Christianity because they showed nothing but love and compassion for everyone. So these guys are the true, like, lovers. Now, the true fighters were the warriors, these knights. These guys took an oath of loyalty to a leader, a king, a nobleman, some of like that, and they fought for them. They basically did whatever they needed to to please their lord, please the king, whoever it may be. And typically they were they were rewarded with land. Yes, they got paid money too, but the big thing that they really, really wanted was land. And these vassals would take care of them, whatever they needed. Um, they needed food, gotcha. Needed fresh water, gotcha. Um, but the thing is, in order to be a knight you need to have the ability of riding a horse and riding well, okay? Now, originally, the knighthood um, 
was only for the noble class. So you had the king, and then you had the other people below, and there were the nobles. So you could only be a knight if you were part of that group. Later on, they would kind of relax on the rules and say, okay, you could represent a noble, you know, or they the nobles would uh, like kind of take on other people to be knights, you know, and things like that. You know, not the very bottom peasant, but maybe uh, somebody above that. Now, near the end of the knighthood era of you know, the Dark Ages, the knights became more seen as a symbol, you know, as these Christian warriors. So because of that, too, they had to kind of clean up their image. And this is where the chivalry code came in. Now, if you don't know what chivalry is, um, basically, if you're a guy, you may have been told by your mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, uncles, somebody told you, hey, open the door for that young lady or that older lady. You know, that's part of chivalry. Letting the lady go in the, the you know, room first. You know, open the door for her and let her go in first. That's chivalry. If you heard a girl screaming for help, you went off and you helped her without thinking about, oh, am I going to get rewarded for this? No, you just went to do it because that was the right thing to do. That was chivalry. Okay. And for those ladies who are my students listening to this, um, I hate to say it, but you guys were seen as a damsel in distress. You know, women couldn't be knights. And you guys were the helpless victims. And, you know, you had to be like, oh, my God, please save me, Mr. Night Guy. That's what you guys were seen as, uh, the ones needed saving. Okay. Now, why did the knighthoods and all that stuff go away? Well, because at the time, at the very beginning, bows and arrows were the top weapons along with swords and things like that. But as time went on, weaponry improved and eventually we got to the point of guns and that armor yeah it might take you know a, one little bullet but if it was a bigger size caliber bullet and if the bullet had enough velocity it could tear through that armor and on top of that think about cannonballs that armor is not going to take a cannonball very well uh, and if you look at that armor really well, too, there's some soft spots, especially right here on, along the arms, you know, that a bullet could go through. Okay. Now, how much, speaking of the armor, how much did it weigh? In total, from head to toe, with all the chain mail and all that stuff, we're talking about 90 pounds. So it was quite a bit. And uh, like I said it in class, and I, you know, it's true, though. I hate to say it, but it's true. <clears throat> if you're a male and you weigh about 120 pounds maybe 130 and you got this 90 pound weight just on you chances are you're not going to do very well with it on um, because again it takes a lot of strength to run in this uh in this armor and to swing a sword and things like that you know and not just like swing it and let it hit the ground no 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 Swing it around, block, counter, things like that while wearing this armor, you know. So just the armor alone, just, you know, that is anywhere from 40 to 70 pounds, depending on the thickness of the armor, okay. The chain mail, the guards you see, the gloves, all that stuff. And then the sword, the sword ranged on average from two and a half pounds to four and a half pounds. Um, the one I have at home, if I was recording this at home, I would show you. Um, it's about a little over three pounds. And that thing is pretty heavy with one hand, you know. But you can still wield it around, you know, things like that. But some bigger swords, which were somewhere like six pounds, they would require two hands because that thing would be too, too big, too large uh, for just one hand. You know, and to be able to use it. The way you're supposed to. All right, so now the Crusades. The Crusades went from 1100 to 1300. There were eight major Crusades battles, but there were also like 13 smaller ones. And 
this all was because of the relationship between the Muslims and the Christians, um, specifically the Turks and the Byzantine. And the thing is, the Byzantine Empire was being attacked by the Turks, and they needed help. So they basically asked the Pope, hey, can you send some soldiers? We need help and things like that. So Pope Urban II, he didn't have any soldiers, but he knew where some soldiers were. So he told the British and the French who were fighting each other, he basically told them, stop, stop fighting each other. Look at you guys are Christian warriors. You need to be fighting this fight and not each other. Now, some of these, Christian warriors were like, well, so we're going to war? And he's like, no, 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 war. Who said anything about war? No, 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 no. You guys are going on a pilgrimage. You guys are fighting for the Christian faith. And to kind of sweeten the deal a little bit, uh, they the Pope basically told them, if you fight in the Crusades and you die, your soul will be clean and you'll be going to heaven so a lot of these guys um who had some guilt they signed up and this other guy named peter the hermit he was a preacher and he was a recruiter for the crusades and he basically spread that word too like hey you know if you did some bad things in your past I understand that. I get that. You know, that sucks. But here's the thing. If you join the crusades and you fight and die, you will be saved. Your soul will be cleansed and you'll be welcome to paradise. Now, a student asked me in class, did people walk? Yeah, some people did. Um, some people rode horses. Some went in caravans and things like that. Um, but some people went on boats. And that's what you see in this map right here the the way some people went on land some went by sea you know so the first crusade the first big problem was who's in charge who's in charge nobody knew nobody knew and so all these guys were like i'm in charge i'm in charge i'm in charge i'm gonna lead this campaign to do this i'm gonna lead this campaign this campaign to do that and strangely enough they were successful. They won. And so some people have seen it as a miracle, but we now know why the First Crusade was won by the Christians, even though they had no leader. And that's because the Muslims were separated. See, under the Muslim religion, there's two groups, or two main groups, the Shiites and the Sunnis. And these guys didn't like each other. And you can still say to this day, they really don't like each other. But the thing is, they didn't help each other. So when one group was fighting the other one, the other one was like, oh, I'm not going to help you. And that's how they lost, because they weren't united. So when the second crusade came, they did unite. They did group together, and they kicked the crap out of the Christians. It wasn't even a fair fight. It was a total disaster for the Christians. Now. Of all the Crusades, I would say if there's one you should remember, it's this one, the third one. Now, the leader of the Muslim was that guy right there. That, that's Saladin. Saladin was, I mean, amazing leader. Very smart. New desert tactic warfare very well. You know, if any of you guys have been to the ocean and you've ran in the sand, like away from the water, like you actually ran, you know how hard that is. And imagine soldiers fighting in sand like that. You know, it's it's tough. It's not easy. But yet, he knew the best way to t use that as their advantage. How to, you know, use dunes and water, the lack of water, things like that, to their advantage. The Christians, however, had three major leaders. Uh, the German Emperor Frederick Barbosa, uh, King Philip II of France, and King Richard I of England. Now, he was known as Richard the Lionheart. And if you've ever heard the story of Robin Hood, uh, 
you watch the movies and some of that, you'll hear it quite a bit on there. Like, oh, King Richard's fighting the Crusades. This is the one they're talking about. Okay. Now, Saladin had this plan. Take Egypt, then Damascus, then Jerusalem. It's just hitting several places, boom, 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 till we get to our goal. And he did it. He was very successful. Now, these three leaders for the Christians um, were getting a lot of pressure from the church because the church was like, hey, you got to take back the Holy Land. you got to take back Jerusalem. It's imperative. You need to. And uh, they did. They were they were fighting them, you know, as much as they could. But again, Saladin was so smart in how to fight, avoid them, things like that. It was pretty interesting. Now, the German Emperor Barbosa, you know, he decides, you know, he's going to go home. Take his men. They're going to go back because uh, they're getting beat. Now, on the way home through some swamp land, he falls off his horse and he falls face front into this water. Now, here's the thing. If you've, again, been to the beach and you stand on the water that the the sea, just the waves crash onto you and things like that, you'll notice sometimes after a while your feet start to sink into the sand, you know, because that's the pressure and things like that. And, you know, the ground is saturated, so it, it's all your weight's just going down, 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 some of that. Um, same thing with muddy water. The ground is not really solid. It's muddy. So when you push down your weight, it's going to cause some problems. And that's what happened with King Barbosa. When he fell in the, in the swamp land, he's trying to push himself up. Remember that weight of the, the, the gear, the, the knights, 90 pounds. So when he's trying to push himself up, he's sinking, his hands are sinking more into the, into the ground, into that mud. And that mud is like, cement so he really can't pull his hands up so his men are trying to they get down off their horses they're trying to pick him up and they can't because again he weighs so much and when they're trying to pick him up with their weight in this mud it uh it causes some problem they can't pick get him so king barbosa drowns in swamp water that's only about four inches deep <laughs> that's how he dies now, the church tells King Richard, you need to go take Egypt. But King Richard's like, well, Egypt's not, doesn't have any religious value. It's not, you know, like Jerusalem. Jerusalem's important. We need to take Jerusalem, but not, why Egypt? So he doesn't really agree with the church in that sense. Like, no, this is not important. Jerusalem is. So he, they go to war for it. And um, at first, no luck. It doesn't go well for them. But during the Battle of Jaffa, King Richard wins. Right? He wins, but he's lost a lot of men. And this is where Saladin comes in and says, look, I've lost a lot of men, but I got more. And uh, we will defeat you. And so he tells them, I'll, I'll make you a promise. I'll allow any unarmed Christians to leave Jerusalem unharmed. You guys can leave Jerusalem, go to your ocean, you know, the Mediterranean Sea, and get on your boats and leave. No, no harm will come to you. I promise you, none of my people will hurt you. But if someone has a sword and they start to try to attack, act a fool they will be hurt so king richard realizing saladin's no joke this guy doesn't play around so he says fine i agree so again king, king richard wins the battle but he doesn't win the war now believe it or not in 1212 um there was idea for a children's crusade and children from France and Germany were encouraged to go fight or convert the Muslims. 
So these kids were basically recruited and they marched towards the Mediterranean Sea, you know, and things like that to go fight. Um, sadly, a lot of these kids were kidnapped. And along the way, a lot of some of them died from um, starvation, disease, you know, dehydration. And those who actually made it to the boats and were able to make it across to Jerusalem, again, were more likely kidnapped afterwards. Okay. Now, the thing is, a lot of people were like, well, why did, who let these kids go? Why would they do that? So these parents who encouraged their kids and the, and the recruiters who encouraged the kids, they needed a scapegoat. They needed to blame somebody. So they came up with a story to avoid responsibility. They made up a story of a Pied Piper playing a flute and he lured the kids away. Now, later on, this story would change to where the Pied Piper led rats out of the town and when the people refused to pay him he played the song and kidnapped their kids but then when they paid him he gave the kids back but originally the story was i don't know he the reason why we don't have any kids around is because the pipe piper came and he took our kids that's the real reason for the pipe piper and if you've ever seen the movie um shrek final chapter um he's the one to get the ogres to get to basically get him because he played his little flute you know so that's where the story came from for the pied piper now here's my question to you if you had to choose between a monk and a knight which one do you think you would be better at and why so again think about it what a monk went through how they spent their lives in servitude how the knights were basically about to, about fighting and things like that, um, wearing all that armor and you know going to battle. Which one do you think you'd be better at, being a monk or being a knight? So the writing prompts on the bottom. I believe I would be a good, which one? Because and explain why. Why do you feel that? Okay. Once you've answered this question, you're done with this lesson. Okay. So hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Okay. So with that being said, guys, you take care, you be safe, and I'll see you guys later. Okay.